Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, boss fired me, and now he can't get the job done because I took all my tools. The second story, the code enforcement officer asked to remove political signs, but I was acting according to the law, so I did not. The third story, manager fired us, we left and chaos began in the restaurant. And the first story is, you can have my programming, but I'd like some money towards the tooling I've paid for. I was working as a machinist in a small machine shop at a big manufacturing company. We were a small team that worked on small, highly customized projects away from the main production line and had a good selection of older manual machines and a couple of modern CNC machines. Due to the nature of the work and the rate it came in, we set our own priorities as needed and would frequently have quiet spells where we could work on our homework projects. Most of the team were apprentices on secondment from the main production area, with only me and one other fully time served and skilled machinist on the department's payroll through an outside agency. The apprentices were paid by the main company. As our department didn't really generate its own income, the apprentices were a much preferred source of labor. Their only cost to the department was in material loss and tool breakage, which were very common occurrences. It was either from lack of experience in the three newer apprentices, or by the sole final year apprentice Liam, who thought that because he was nearing the end of his training, that he knew it all, much as me and my skilled colleague tried to advise otherwise. As a result of the minimal department income and the regular apprentice mistakes, good lathe tooling was few and far between. My colleague, who'd been at the company most of his working life, kept all the tools he needed to use locked away for only his use and mine if I needed to borrow something obscure, as he could trust me to take care of them. As I'd only been there a couple of years but had my own lathe at home, I brought a lot of my own tooling in, or brought it myself, rather than go through the battle with the purchasing department, and as such being for everyone to use, important later. After about 2.5 years a new head of development, HOD, was employed, who took on several departments including ours. Within six months of him starting a new manager was assigned to our department. The old guy was great and ran the department to the best of his ability, but the HOD didn't like that we appeared to be a money pit, so off he went. My colleague had a bad feeling about things as soon as HOD took over and somehow knew that we wouldn't be too far down the list. I was more optimistic as we could be depended on to get things done in a clinch and we had experience the apprentices didn't and our contracts were pretty solid and that they'd have to find a really good and legitimate reason to get rid of us. My colleague didn't like all the changes, was already well past retirement age and decided to call it a day. As the company had gone through several ownerships over his time with them and his tools weren't documented, he gave a few to me and took the rest with him. With him gone, I thought there'd be little chance of them getting rid of me as there'd be no one to supervise the younger apprentices or to do the work that was beyond their abilities. Liam had officially finished his apprenticeship in the summer and was now, at least by title, a fully fledged machinist. Anyone who's worked in the job should know that this doesn't mean much in the grand scheme of things. There's always more to learn and more experience to gain, but he was so full of himself that he felt he no longer needed any advice from me, and much to my amusement, the mistakes kept happening. If anything, they were more frequent by him trying and failing to prove a point. It was quite obvious he really didn't appreciate my input, so I stopped offering guidance and just let him get on with it. Unfortunately, Liam was quite friendly with the new boss, and that would ultimately be my demise. The new boss was also health and safety mad, which I don't have a problem with in the slightest. I know and fully appreciate the importance when implemented reasonably, and that gave Liam an opportunity to do away with the only other person above him, me. In my collection of tools, I had two shop-made mallets, which the previous boss had absolutely no issue with, but they mysteriously made their way out of my locked toolbox onto my new boss's desk. The boss wasn't hands-on and wouldn't want to get his suit dirty coming onto the shop floor, so it was fairly obvious that the ex-apprentice was the one to break into my toolbox. There was nothing unsafe about the mallets. The brass faces were shrunk fit into a solid steel head with a welded steel handle attached. You could beat on them for days and not separate the brass faces. But they weren't proper equipment, in other words bought from a tool supplier, so I was sacked pretty much on the spot. I had to gather all my belongings and leave, but I knew this would cause issues as the CNC programs were all written for my tools. And as angry as I was that Liam had broken into my toolbox and ratted me out, I still didn't want everything to go to SH without me. My boss was aware most of the CNC programs were backed up to my personal USB storage, 
and asked me to transfer everything before leaving. I complied with the request, transferred all the programs even though I wasn't legally contracted to do so, but I knew he'd need more than that. Throwing him a bone, I advised that the programs were written for my tooling. In his eyes, that immediately meant that I should leave everything required for use, which I begrudgingly agreed to for a token payment towards their value. He scoffed, told me to take my tools and get off the site. It took a lot longer than I expected for them to realize that their very expensive CNC lathe was now next to useless without spending over 3,000 pounds on new tooling. My 800 pound offer was now incredibly appealing after three weeks of it sitting idle. But of course my boss was still trying to make the books look better and phoned up offering me 400 pounds. I reciprocated the scoff. He gave me three weeks prior and hung up. The next story is, political signs can only go up 30 days before any election? Okay. So back in August, my wife and I decided we wanted to put up a sign to promote our preferred candidate for the upcoming presidential election here in Texas. I wanted to see what my town's ordinances said about what and where we could put the sign up as we were planning to put up a banner on our front fence that is very prominent facing traffic that goes along the side of our house, but that's at the edge of our property. The ordinances had a few rules about where the sign could and couldn't be, e.g. don't put them on a utility pole. The max size of the sign, 36 square feet, how high off the ground, etc. It also said that political signs would be allowed 30 days prior to any election. Note here it didn't say the election, which would have implied that the election had to be related to the sign. As far as I was concerned, it could be, as the ordinance said in plain English, any election. So we ordered a 36 square foot banner off of Etsy, nailed and tied it to the fence on a Saturday in August. The next Monday, code enforcement dropped by and said something along the lines, we had an inquiry about your sign. It isn't in compliance with the ordinance and asked us to take it down. I wasn't home at the time. My wife told him that I wasn't home, but that I had read the ordinance and it said any election and that we were in compliance. There was some back and forth. They settled on if you request a sign permit, that would give us a month with the sign up, then we would be within 30 days of early voting in Texas, which is how the town has traditionally interpreted the meaning of 30 days prior to any election. So I get home from running the errand I was on, and my wife tells me what has transpired. I still thought the sign was legal under the ordinance, but to make my wife happy, I applied for and was granted the permit. Two days later, the same code enforcement officer came to our house and said that the town manager had overruled his issuing of the permit and that the sign needed to come down. I told him that I only applied for the permit to make my wife happy and that the sign has always been legal under the ordinance and that the town was not without choices as it could clean up the language in the ordinance. More back and forth. I asked him what the next steps were. You know, do you remove the sign? Would have made great footage from my security camera. Do you cite me? Etc. Etc. He said he would talk to the town manager. I said that I would be happy to discuss it with the town manager. So the town manager calls me later that day. Says things like, most people don't put 36 square foot signs on residential property. I told him that I wasn't most people. I knew that I was following the letter of the ordinance and that the sign was up in accordance with any election, including the fact that several of the 54 primaries are currently happening, 50 states, territories, and voters overseas, and that those are all elections for the purposes of the ordinance. He says that he would contact the town's lawyer. Hours later, he calls back. I guess the town's lawyer was not busy that day and was able to opine instantly on the matter. He says the town's lawyer thinks the ordinance is enforceable, but that they have decided to not take any enforcement action. I told him I still believed I was in compliance because I was following the any election provision, but that he was making the right choice as there was a pandemic going on. But I had also been doing some research. Many people think of Texas as very similar to the rest of the South, where local government is best. But my understanding of how things work in Texas is that cities and towns cannot do things that the state doesn't allow them to do. So things are often enumerated or restricted at the state level. And it just so happens that Texas has a chapter on political signs. Title 15 is regulating political funds and campaigns, and chapter 259 is political signs. 259.003 is titled, Regulation of Political Signs by Municipality, and says in part, a municipal charter provision or ordinance that regulates signs may not for a sign that contains primarily a political message and that is located on private real property with the consent of the property owner, prohibit the sign from being placed. It looks like there are some caveats elsewhere in the chapter, such as it applies to signs 36 square feet and smaller, etc., but definitely applies to my circumstances. So the town's ordinance restricts someone from placing a political sign 30 days before any election. It sure seems like that violates this section of Texas law. Now armed with some information, I went to town council and spoke at one of the open forums, where residents can address the council on any topic. 
My town is pretty small, full of people who don't share my political views, and the council reflects that pretty well. But I told them about how the ordinance appeared to violate Texas law. I also told them about a recent Supreme Court ruling from 2015 that set a bit of a surprising precedent. Basically, under certain conditions, the town might have to survive strict scrutiny when taking enforcement actions on signs and demonstrate a narrowly tailored compelling government interest for why certain signs could only be up for short times versus other signs being up for longer times. Anyway, the town has worked with me on this issue, and the town manager is a busy person. But he did say that the town's lawyer and him would circle up and propose changes to council in the coming months. The last story is Work a double and get written up, or In high school, a few friends and myself worked at a local chain restaurant. We were fully able to run the day shift, but had never really broken down the equipment and closed up for the evening. One particular night, a few of the night shift had called in sick. We were asked to pull a double and close the restaurant, which we did. Essentially work from 10 a.m. until after midnight. Myself and my three friends and a manager. We were really tired, but felt that we had done the right thing and helped out the company. The next day, the four of us come in to work another day shift. The day manager pulls us into her office one by one and informs us that she would need to write us up because we hadn't properly cleaned and filtered the fry grease. Regardless of our leaning in for a double, having never closed or been trained on closing procedures, and having been given permission by the night manager to leave, meaning all closing work had been completed. After a quick chat with my friends, it was a line that I was going to push back on the write-up, and if the day manager insisted on writing us up, we would quit. I informed the manager that we were collectively not going to sign the write-up slips. Her alternative threat was that we would be fired, to which I informed her that if she insisted on writing us up for helping out, pulling a double, not being trained, and having been released by the night manager, then we would quit. A staring contest follows. I eventually break in with an, okay, I guess we're fired then. We turned in our hats quit symbolically and left. It was really, really amazing. My friend quit mid-burger prep. My other friend simply walked off the cash register in the middle of taking an order. We clocked out and walked out the back, leaving only the day manager in the restaurant. Customers in line, customers at the drive through Later that same day, we decided to return to our place of prior employment to have dinner. The night shift must have still been sick as the entire restaurant was staffed with managers from nearby restaurants. Same chain, including our day manager, who was now pulling her own double and the night manager that had released us the prior evening. There was nothing better than eating our burgers and watching the management staff fail at every station and knowing that their pride, lack of rational flexibility, and threats had resulted in one of the most righteous meals we ever ate together. Needless to say, we were all employed at the next chain restaurant down the street in a matter of days. It's been nearly 30 years and I remember that standoff, her ultimatum, and our walk out like it was last week. We actually thought they wouldn't take the order at all, but we were greeted by a manager from another store. Honestly, they were so busy that it wasn't until our meal was mostly done that we got the attention of our previous managers. We actually felt bad for the other management staff that got called in, but wholly felt justified in taking our stand. I hope you love these stories. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know when the new videos come out.